DW5. Happy, healthy children. A sleek and modern skyline. I've been trying to figure out this place that everybody seems to hate. And limitless adoration for their leader. But is it really as it seems? It is a great drama, but one that is rotten from its core. Is there someone who will tell us what we're doing here? Avery Haynes travels into the great unknown of North Korea. There's no one who's going to explain what this yeah. is? It's people living on the edge. 99% don't have enough to eat. The media carefully control. I thought it was allowed to shoot. And the horrors of those who escape. I see people dying on the street. From the most secretive place on the planet. But was that all fake? And... Here's Joe Murphy in! Murphy scores! One man's dream to play in the big leagues. We just wanted to go out. We just wanted to play. Takes him to the heights of the game. <laughs> I'm the happiest man in the world. Only to have it all fall apart. He was starting to do drugs, and he was starting to drink. Rick Westhead goes in search of a missing Stanley Cup winner. Hey, Joe. I'm Rick. Homeless, alone, and troubled. Somewhere in this is where he's living. Crying out for help. No, no, I'm not doing well. I don't think I maybe need some help. And all but forgotten. He's a good human being. He doesn't deserve to live like this. Here is Kevin Newman. Hello, and thanks for joining us. This week, we're taking you inside the world's most secretive and dangerous country, a Canadian television exclusive that took months of negotiating with diplomats to arrange. W5's Avery Haynes was watched during her entire trip to the capital of North Korea, the repressive regime controlling everything she saw. While warming relations between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un have created a bit of an opening in the hermit kingdom, as Avery discovered, you might not want to believe everything you see inside. It has one of the most powerful militaries in the world. North Korea, the so-called hermit kingdom, the most isolated country on Earth, sends a message to the outside world on its 70th anniversary. A message of brute strength and unity. A nation marching to its own beat. Strictly choreographed goose-stepping soldiers by the thousands stomp through Kim Il-sung Square. But perhaps more jarring than the tanks and missiles on display is the fervor of the people. They're chanting Manse, long live, to their leader, Kim Jong-un, who's watching from above. Like most major public displays, the parade takes place in the center of the country's capital, Pyongyang, perhaps the most mystifying city in the world. At first glance, it could be any cosmopolitan capital, with its surprisingly modern skyline and impressive landmarks like the Ark of Triumph and the Juche Tower. But there's almost no noise. A city of more than three million people enveloped in an eerie calm. There are so few cars that most intersections don't even have lights. Instead, they're staffed by traffic police. And everywhere, the legacy of a family tree of despotic dictators looms large. Pyongyang is an exclusive city. Even North Korean citizens from the countryside need a permit to visit. People here can't make phone calls to the outside world, and most can never leave the country. W5 has been granted a rare invitation, but as we'll discover again and again, the government control we'll face is excessive. Sorry, sorry. am I allowed to shoot or not? Okay, I, I thought it was allowed to shoot. After all, North Korea has the most extreme restrictions on the media of anywhere in the world. As part of the 70th anniversary celebrations, the secretive government has allowed in an influx of dozens of international journalists and more than a thousand tourists, including a few from Canada. I was born in 1948, the same year that the DPRK was founded. So I said, well, what better year to go? We're, we're both gonna be 70 the same year, so here I am in Pyongyang. 
Canadian. Malcolm Guy is from Montreal. Canadian. Give me a sense of what your draw was to coming to North Korea. You know, for so many years, I've been trying to figure out this place that everybody seems to hate. But I'm looking, I'm looking around Pyongyang here, and I see these amazing buildings. They all look like very comfortable. I'm with the people. We're just walking all around and looking at the stuff. I said, this doesn't compute with the North Korea that I was told about for practically all the years of my life. And yet the reality is that you're in this beautiful sh showcase city and that Pyongyang doesn't necessarily represent all of North Korea. Oh, I mean, yes, in the countryside, it's not like Pyongyang. And I'm sure we've been shown the best stuff. North Korea, or more accurately, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, was established on September 9, 1948. The entire Korean peninsula had been ruled by the Japanese government since early in the 20th century. But after Japan was defeated in the Second World War, the country was divided in two. The first premier was Kim Il-sung, known by the people here simply as the eternal leader. He ruled for nearly half a century before his eldest son, Kim Jong-il, took over in 1994 and ruled the country during the massive famine in which hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions, died. The current leader, Kim Jong-un, took over from his father in 2011. All three Kims have been merciless dictators, and for decades their country has been synonymous with secrecy, starvation, and suffering. In the past seven years, North Korea has tested more than 80 missiles. And while Kim Jong-un has pledged to dismantle the country's nuclear program, North Korea is the only country to test nuclear weapons this century. 99% don't have enough uh, to eat. They don't have enough in terms of medication. They don't have enough in terms of employment uh, prospects. They don't have mobil mobility to move. Christopher Kim is the executive director of Han Voice, based in Toronto, a Canadian nonprofit organization that champions the human rights of North Korean citizens and refugees. The government has a clamp on all social or all state-run media, including radio, TV, etc. And it utilizes media to brainwash its own citizens. In North Korea that you are describing to me, sounds like a cult. It's been described as a personality cult that three um, lines of dictators have implemented in order to keep strict control of the people. The government also has strict control over the foreign media, so we'll only see what the government wants us to see, all of it under the watchful eye of our minder, Mr. La, who never leaves our side. It's our first full day in Pyongyang. Alongside a throng of other journalists, we're being brought here to a brand new teacher's college. But before going in, we've all been given 10 pages of rules to follow. For example, reporting on anything that the government feels could aggravate the relationship between North Korea and other countries means a sentence of five to 10 years of reform through labor. Foreign journalists must also wear government-issued armbands at all times. Why do we why do we have to wear these? Security said that one of the domestic people do. You saw that in your press. So, so that people know I'm a journalist. I gotcha. But before we can see the classrooms, first a mandatory tour of several rooms filled with giant photos of the North Korean leader on a visit here. In our factory tours in the days to come, we'll see a seemingly endless array of similar giant images adorning the walls. The Kim family members visiting the factories, sniffing, waving, pointing, even posing before photos of earlier photos. But what we're supposed to learn from all of this is unclear. Mr. La, is there someone who will tell us what we're doing here? We'll explain. This is one of the revolutionary the history of the Min University of Education. But is there someone from, this, from the university who will come here and explain what we're seeing? I mean, there's a lot of pictures of Kim Jong-un, but I don't know what, what we're seeing. I don't know. So. No? There's, no? there's no one who's going to explain what this yeah. is? And we're not the only ones confused. Other journalists are as well. 
that. We don't know what we're looking at. Could, you, could someone explain to us? You want to come back here? Well, if someone could just explain what we're seeing. Could the, could the tour guide come back in? We just don't know what we're looking at otherwise. But none of the officials here offer any insight. I just am trying to figure out what we're doing here. You mentioned um, we were going to come to this school and we could talk to students, but we're just looking at pictures of your leader. Mm. It's one of the, the education teachers. The school leader has a team. Uh, what is the importance of teaching for students, for teachers? No, it's I understand one... the importance of the leader coming here, but I thought we were going to be able to talk to students. Yeah. This time is not the uh, this time is the lecture time, lecture time. So can we go to a, can we go to the interrupt the, the lecture time? So can we go to a lecture? So I don't know exactly. So we have only for all the guys, the guys I don't know. But our reminder just keeps taking us to more rooms of pictures of the leader. Can we go in and look at the yeah, yeah. at the lecture? But sure, we can't sure. talk. But we can't talk to the yeah, students. Yeah. We can talk to the students. No. 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 According to college officials, 1,500 future teachers are studying here. They're learning to teach music and painting and even robotics. Eventually, there was one group of students that they let us talk to. Good morning, students. Do you speak English? Unfortunately, these are only virtual students. This class of computerized kids is used as a teaching tool for future instructors. What do you know about Canada? Canada is in North America. Canada is in North America, yes. And what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a teacher. Everyone wants to be teachers. <laughs> After a couple of hours at the teacher's college, we're off to our next stop to continue our guided government tour. For the next several days, the only glimpses of the city we'll see are from the windows of this bus. Next up, we're heading to a silk plant that our minders are eager to show off as a sign of North Korea's economic strength. The tour starts along the assembly line. We're told that these cocoons are supplied to the government by volunteers from the countryside. The cocoons are soaked in water along the conveyor belts. Dozens of women in matching outfits pull apart the cocoons to create thin threads. The threads are then bundled to create thicker and thicker threads of silk. Officials claim the factory produces 40 tons of silk per month, about half of which is exported. What remains is sent to other local factories to make clothes and other products. In all, we're told, 1,600 people work here, seemingly all of them women. According to this minder, Mr. O, oh, prior to 1945, when Korea was under Japanese colonial rule, the workers here were unhappy and overworked, but he says all that has changed. So during the colonize by the Japanese, the employees worked so hard. This, this, the employees who are working in this company before the liberation, this, the life is quite miserable. So, but now we renovate this company very recently. So now all the employees are working so happy. We've been brought here. We, there are two things that we saw today. We went to the school, mm -hmm. and now we've been brought to this factory. Why is it important for us, the foreign media, to come to this factory? I, every guy, I mean, most journalists, the press man, really want to see the real life, newly, not formal. If you really want to see the form before the life, you go to the mountains or ancient tombs. That this is the future. The future. This is the economy. No. No. Why do you think they would take us to a silk factory? I would imagine that there would be two reasons. One, silk is a fabric of luxury. They would want the outside world to see that North Korea can produce lavish, luxurious goods. Um, it would prop up the government's own um, narrative of, of what it is. The second would be to show that North Korea um, is, has modern elements that can contribute to a thriving market economy. In Pyongyang, we saw this incredible city of tall skyscrapers and seemingly happy people. Is that the real North Korea? No. That's a show that the 
government is putting on for tourists like yourself. The government wants uh, the international community to see one version of itself, a manicured, um, beautiful, thriving, happy society, a utopia. Um, but sadly, it is far from that. Um, every actor within a tourist experience has been carefully placed, uh, has been asked to say certain things, has been um, committed to show one aspect of North Korea. It is all coordinated. It's a city of theater. It is a city of theater. It is a great drama, uh, but one that is rotten from its core. A carefully crafted facade. In reality, it is sadly quite different. Hides a dark reality. Being in that country is like a hell. When W5 continues. This is the North Korea that the government here wants the world to see, the apparent future of their country. Dozens of adorable, immaculately groomed and dressed young children singing and dancing in unison, each seemingly flawless child an important part of a perfectly in-tune collective. This is a daycare and kindergarten at a factory farm. 250 children, we're told, live at the farm, along with their parents who work here. Among the crops are peppers and beets and soybeans. But here's the weird thing. While supposedly more than 1,000 farmers work here, we're escorted around this sprawling model farm for a couple of hours. But we don't see a single farmer, not one. In fact, the vast property feels more like a ghost farm. Christopher Kim is a Toronto-based advocate for the human rights of North Koreans. We saw lots of joyous children. We didn't see a farmer. Was that all fake? Yes, I would say that the farm was um, a, a movie, in a sense, a real-life movie. You were seeing actors um, playing their roles in creating this fiction of a North Korea. You were seeing the most manicured version of what uh, the regime wants you to think of North Korea, which is a utopia of sorts, um, when in reality it is sadly quite different. Being in that country is like a hell, but it's so bad because you don't even know that you're in hell. This man, who we're calling John, spent the first 14 years of his life in North Korea. He escaped and is now a student attending university in Toronto, while he and his mother fight to stay in Canada. W5 has agreed to hide their identities because they say they still fear being targeted by North Korea. When I was in North Korea, I was hungry on the street. I see people dying on the street. I see homeless person dying on the street. We had no internet, no computer, no TV. We didn't have a, have a toilet. The bathroom we had was just a hole in the ground. We had no water, no electricity. John, your description of life outside of Pyongyang is one that's extremely harsh and brutal. Yes, it's a reality that it's happening. Their bleak life in North Korea got even worse when they say John's mother was imprisoned because she wouldn't give false testimony about a co-worker. And while she was in detention, they, will, they won't let her sleep. They beat her. Um, they would do all this hard stuff on her. You were falsely detained, beaten, and tortured. Yes. For the six months she says she was in custody, John, whose father had died, was left abandoned. He was just 10 years old. Worst thing I remember was one night I couldn't any, find any food, and then I was just in an abandoned building, and I was so hungry, and I looked around, I found that rat. So I made a fire. I burned every part, everything. I burned because I didn't want to see the guts and everything. And I ate because I was so hungry. I had no other option. I, I ate. 
Eventually, John says that like his mother, he was falsely imprisoned and tortured by police. All I remember was at that fireplace, there's a metal stick that was in there for squeezing fire and stuff, but um, the metal stick was red. And when he burned my waist, um, I didn't felt the pain right away. I just saw that it was burning and I saw that the white smoke comes out from my wrist. He took a red hot poker that had been in the fire and laid it across your wrist? Yes, he touched my wrist with a stick like this. And then my head was turning white and then I passed out. His scars are an ever-present reminder of the life they escaped. And for his mother, those years come back to her when she sleeps. Uh, she's still nightmares about being tortured, um, running away, and just getting beat up in just that prison, that detention place all over again. Uh, um, I mean, even we're in Canada, but we still feel like or we know that North Korea will still look for us. So we interviewed a mother and son who described for us a harrowing life in North Korea of false imprisonment, of torture as a young child and as a mother. Is this a story that you're hearing from people who have made it out? Absolutely. Oftentimes in North Korea, when you're undergoing harsh treatment, so for instance, forced labor in a labor camp. You don't really know why you're there. You don't really know, um, but you've quickly come to believe that perhaps you've done something wrong. You deserve it. Yes. If you and I were having this conversation sitting in Pyongyang right now, what would happen to you for telling me all this? I'd be dragged away, never to be seen again. And if my family was there, then three generations mm -hmm. of us would also be dragged away, never to be seen again. Hey, so you can understand why North Korean citizens would choose their words carefully. Like the couple we met in Pyongyang, Mr. and Mrs. Lee Chol Hoik, alongside their 11-year-old daughter, the only spontaneous encounter we had on the streets. And what are you hoping for the future of Korea? Yeah. The future, our country will continue to prosper as long as we have our great leader Kim Jong-un with us. What does he wish that we knew about his country that we don't know? You should know about our power. What does he mean that we should know about the power of Korea? Nothing can stop our country because of our power, and we are good as long as we have our supreme leader, Kim Jong-un. We are not afraid of any enemy. We live with the certainty that we will win as long as we have a leader. Thank you. Back at Kim Il-sung Square in Pyongyang, it's the final night of celebrations for North Korea's 70th anniversary. A stunning torch ceremony where the country's unwavering unity and conformity is once again on display. Tens of thousands of students put on an incredible show of synchronicity, discipline, and of course, loyalty to their leader. The final note of their performance, chants of man say, man say, long live, Long live. Well, the slight opening to the world that Kim Jong-un has allowed keeps paying off for him. This week, the South Korean government said it's considering limiting its economic sanctions on the North. And U.S. President Trump said he's looking forward to seeing his friend Kim again very soon. Here's what's straight ahead on W5. What started as a dream come true... Joe Murphy. ...fades away to nothing. Wow, this is crazy. When W5 continues...